Welcome everybody uh, to this afternoon's webinar. My name is Andy Shaner. I'm an education and public outreach specialist with the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Houston. And I will be uh, leading you through this webinar today. And with me today is my colleague, Heather Dalton. Heather. And I am Heather Dalton. I'm also here at the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Houston. Um, so if you experience any technical problems during the webinar, please send a private message to Brian Russell or Colleen Barbas to do this. Just put your cursor over one of the names at the top right and a private chat message will pop up. If you click on that, then you can send a message directly to them. And Heather will be here um, answering any questions or responding to any comments in the chat box that you might have. So if you have a question about what we're talking about here today or a general comment, uh, anything at all, type it in there and Heather uh, will respond um, either directly to you or we might bring it up uh, and, and talk to the whole group about it. We'll just, we'll just see how it goes. So uh, with that, I don't want to say too much more, um, but uh, well, a little bit about LPI. We are a small... Uh, private research institute uh, focusing on mainly planetary science, a little bit of earth science. Um, uh, we're funded mostly by NASA, uh, a little bit by NSF, but, but for the most part NASA. Um, and besides our science programming, we also have an education group uh, that does a lot of education programming for NASA and brings programs like this, like Explore, uh, out, out there into the public. Uh, Explore itself was started, I think, in 1998, so about 16 years ago. Um, some librarians in Louisiana contacted the education group at, here at LPI at that time and wanted to work with them to create activities that would help them bring uh, planetary and space science into their libraries in, in a way that didn't make uh, kids feel like they were in school again. Uh, so in a fun way, but still bringing across the science and that's what Explore does. It brings you our current understanding of the various topics um, that we have, the various models that we have, in a fun and um, really an inexpensive way too. Uh, when we when we when we have done um, uh, in-person uh, trainings like this, uh, all the materials that we get are from Walmart for the most part. Maybe a few exceptions, but all very cheap. Um, a lot of them are craft items that you may just have laying around also, um, but meant to be inexpensive, designed again for an out-of-school setting. And they're very flexible. In other words, and for example, in the Marvel Moon that we're going to talk about some of the activities today, you don't have to do them all in sequence. You can just pick some of them out and do them individually by themselves, or you can do them all. Uh, it's, it's, it's just totally up to you. Uh, so in addition to creating these different modules about Explore, uh, we, we have provided training uh, in person and webinars like today to children's and youth librarians and we recently have started working with the American Camp Association to do trainings with those folks as well. Um, originally it was funded I believe through NSF but a lot of the recent modules have been funded through uh, uh, money from NASA. Another great thing about the Explore uh, mod program programming the modules and activities is you can make it in your own. You know, make them fit for whatever your audience needs are. We'll show you kind of in general how you might do something um, and what you would what you would use to what kind of materials you would use for those activities. But again, it's totally up to you to customize these for your own audiences and facilities. Um, so if you went to the Marvel Moon website, this is what you see. Um, this is Welcome to Explore Marvel Moon. And there on the left-hand side, to get to that, if you just went to the Explore website, which you see is lpi.usra.edu slash explore, you would see a menu over here. And if you clicked on hands-on activities, you would see all the different modules that we have available, covering Mars, Earth, engineering, Jupiter, uh, icy worlds, uh, health and space, which is related to astronaut health, um, to the moon, even comets. So a lot of different, uh, a lot of different uh, topics. So if you, if you were to click on Marvel Moon, then you would see this page would come up, and you'd, you'd see the welcome page. There'd be a link. We'd click on to see what the various activities are in the, in the module. Background reading, which is kind of gets more into the science. It's, it's not real heavy. It's certainly more than, than your kids and your programs probably are going to want to know. But it gives you enough 
so that you can be able to answer those questions should they have them. Um, resources include uh, links to uh, video clips, uh, PowerPoint presentations that have been used in the past for these kind of webinars, and just other general uh, book lists, things that you might find uh, helpful if you want to include this in your programming. And one of the really neat things about this particular module, Marvel Moon, is that it's all kind of centered around this comic book or graphic novel theme. And all of the, and here's an example of some of the pages, and all the characters uh, in this Marvel Moon module are all based off of actual real scientists. It uses their real names, Clark Chapman, uh, Hal Levison, Luke Dones, um, Robin Canuff. These are all actual scientists, lunar scientists. They're at the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado. Um, and we've just kind of given them a superhero uh, personas um, because they are kind of superheroes in that they say some pretty cool things about the moon. Okay, let's move on to the, our activities. Uh, one thing I'll mention is that a couple weeks ago we had the, the first of these two webinars that we looked more at <coughs> excuse me, the activities that dealt with the science of the moon, the geology, our, our current understanding of the way the moon looks the way it does today and why. Today we're looking at uh, more of the personal and cultural connections to the moon. Uh, specifically we're going to start off looking at how the moon has influenced cultures or what different cultures have to say about the moon. And then we'll look at a couple of very specific ways the moon does influence life on Earth or influences the Earth directly. All right, so here's this is a picture of the moon. This is, though it's not quite as bright as what we usually would see in the nighttime sky on a full moon, this is about the, all the features that we would see uh, with the naked eye or with a, a small telescope or binoculars. Uh, so I have a question. I want to put up a little a poll here and ask everyone a question. We ask you to please participate in this. Yeah, so it kind of, kind of blocks that a little bit. That's all right. Um, you probably have heard of things like, you know, the man on the moon and maybe other things in the moon. But when you look at the moon, what, what, what kind of little characters do you see? So go up there and check one of those, and I think you can even be able to check them all, or, or two, or, or just maybe just one of them. What, what have you seen? What different shapes do you see when you look at the moon? It's obviously it's getting at some cultural aspects of the moon, and yes, different cultures do see different things in the moon. So a lot of people, about two-thirds of us, have heard about the man on the moon. That's that's pretty common. Squirrel and the poodle, yeah, that's yeah, that's that's it's funny how you may have never heard of these, but when you see the word and you, all of a sudden the thing kind of pops out on the moon, do you? Okay. Okay, great. Well thank you. And about a quarter of us, or five, about a fifth of us, the rabbit in the moon. Yeah. There's a couple different stories about that, and we'll we'll see we'll see that uh, here in a second. So, well thank you. Great. Yes, yeah, so those are actually all different. Uh, well, at least the first three are um, there are uh, stories about those. The uh, fourth one actually is something that one of our scientists likes to talk about and has has, has drawn pictures of. Um, we uh, have asked that question to uh, kids that come to LPI to participate in some of our family days that we have here, and we we give them a picture of the moon and ask them to draw what they see. So here's, here's some examples. Somebody once, oops, somebody once saw Aladdin's lamp. The smoke coming out. Looks like um, a little kid playing baseball, maybe, or, or a man walking his dog. So all kind of things. It's kind of like looking at clouds. Uh, so there's an activity. What do you see in the moon? And this activity stresses that the moon is and has been important to many cultures. Um, it's also points out the moon is accessible. It's right there in the sky. Everybody can see it. Almost everybody knows what it is. Almost everybody knows it has different shapes at different times of the month. And so it, it's there. Everybody is familiar with it. And this activity can be a standalone. Again, like I said, you can use it. Maybe you're having a night sky viewing um, or you want to do um, part of the activities we talked about a few weeks ago and bring it in as part of the Growing Up Moon series. A lot of things you can do with it. It's totally up to you how you want to incorporate this. So there's a, a sheet in the comic book that has you a picture of the moon and gives uh, kids a chance to then outline what it is that they see in the moon and maybe tell a story about what they see. 
So I'll just bring up that the Chinese have, have this story of a jade rabbit and a frog on the moon. I'm not really going to go into that story in particular. It is an interesting story, and there are several different versions of it uh, if, if you look into that. But I do want to point out that, you know, at least in the American space program, a lot of things that we name our spacecraft after, particularly during the early days, had to do with Greek mythology or maybe even Roman mythology. But the Chinese have gotten into the space game uh, recently, and they put a lander and a little rover on the moon, and they called it Chong O. And Chong O is the what turned out to be the frog uh, on the moon, and the U2 was the uh, little rover, and that's the Jade Rabbit on the moon. So they took their own culture and their own history um, and applied that to their exploration of the moon. And this picture is just uh, it's. Uh, within within the past five months, it's, it's a pretty relatively new picture. All right, I want to show you a few more slides here. Uh, a fact or fiction? What have you heard about the moon? So again, sticking with the you know, the cultural uh, aspects of, of of the moon. So let's bring up a few more polls here. Okay, true or false? Getting your hair cut during the full moon will make it grow faster. Is that true or false? Have you heard that? Or do you experience this and know it, believe it to be true or false? So most of us are saying that it's false. And, and technically, yes, that's false. <laughs> I really don't want to say that if it seems to be that uh, your moon grows faster during a full moon, that may very well be. But in terms of the overall numbers and percentages, no, the grow, your hair does not grow faster uh, during, during a full moon. All right, so let's bring up another poll here. Another question. The moon pulls on the oceans and creates tides. Is that true or false? Does the moon have that kind of an influence on the Earth? As small as the moon is and it's relatively distance from the Earth, can it actually do that? Does it influence or create tides? And so far, this seems to be an overwhelming majority. Everybody says it's true, and that is. That is true. Uh, the moon does cause tides. And we'll see later on um, a kinesthetic, we call, activity uh, to help illustrate this or try to help uh, children understand this idea of tides and why we have them. You know, one thing you can do also is just have a general discussion with kids. You know, what what have they heard about the moon? And just kind of, it's just, it's just interesting to see what they say and what they've heard or what they think is to believe to be true. Okay, here's one. We only, or we see only one side of the moon because it is not spinning. Is that true or false? It's true that we see one side of the moon. When you're standing here on Earth and any time you look at a full moon, you always see the same side. But is it because the moon is not spinning? That's the key part. That's the true or false we're looking at here. The moon is not spinning. Is that true or false? Is that why we only see one side of the earth? Okay. That is a false statement. Uh, the moon does, it does spin. It does rotate. It's just that it rotates at the same speed that it orbits the Earth. So the amount of time it takes the moon to make one rotation or one spin once on its axis is the same amount of time that it takes to orbit or go around the Earth one time as well. So it's just an interesting uh, phenomenon that actually occurs right now um, earlier on, you know, a long time ago in solar system's history, it, it spun faster and it will, it has continued to slow down its spinning so in the 
just the future will spin even slower. And it will also be getting farther away from us. So in the past, it was closer to the Earth. It spun faster. It's been gradually going away from us. It will also slow down as it continues to go away from us. And by us, I mean the Earth. All right, got a couple of more here. True or false? People have actually been to the moon. You'd be surprised how people would answer this question. Or maybe you wouldn't be surprised at how people answer this question. Or I should say the conversations that we sometimes get involved with and you know, not initiated on our part. Okay, that is true, yes. We, we have put astronauts on the moon. It's been a long time. Okay, so that's kind of part of the problem, especially with little with kids. Is it's been so long since that happened um, that it's it's just it just seems so out of reach for them. And, and and you know we see NASA today that doesn't appear to be as productive and is not putting people on the moon or or on Mars or any other solid body other than the Earth. It just seems kind of hard to hard to believe, but it is true. That we not only put two, we put twelve on the moon. Would have had 14, but there was that unfortunate accident with the third mission, Apollo 13, that was supposed to land men on the, land the astronauts on the moon. Great movie, Apollo 13, if you want to learn more about that. Okay, there's a couple more. Oops. True or false? More babies are born during the full moon. This kind of goes along with the idea of there's more rest during the full moon or emergency rooms and hospitals are busier during a full moon. True or false? A little, little more split on this one. Okay. Statistically speaking, Okay, this is false. Statistically speaking, babies are not more likely to be born during the full moon than at any other time. Okay? Now, you may hear stories from people you know in hospitals talking about this or talking about um, uh, like an increase in full moon stuff. Uh, but there are a number of studies that have been done on this and, and, and all these different things you hear about human behavior as being influenced by a full moon. And, and there is no truth. Uh, to, to many of them. Now it is true during a full moon people might be more active because the, it is more bright, it is brighter outside, there is more light uh, particularly if you're in darker areas, if you're not in the middle of a city but if you're out and not in the middle of a city, it is brighter outside from a full moon but we don't necessarily see an increase um, in, in all these uh, human behaviors that we that we're kind of told culturally. Okay, one more One more, and then we'll move on. And this is an interesting one. And this always cracks me up. True or false? The moon has no gravity. True or false? The moon has no gravity. Okay. Okay. This particular statement is false. The moon does have gravity. Um, to see a simple example of that, as long as you believe that we really did land astronauts on the moon, look at a picture of them. They're standing on it. If the moon didn't have gravity, they wouldn't have been able to stand on it. They would have just taken a step and floated right off of it. Now, the moon's gravity it's um, the force of gravity, so the force of the moon's gravity that pulls on objects is smaller than the Earth's. And it's much smaller, it's about a sixth of the Earth's, but it does have gravity. Okay. Okay, so those are a few, uh, some 
uh, uh, fact or fiction, some moon myths or truths you may have heard. Um, and we have there's an activity that that, that explores this idea uh, with with students. It's called or I'm sorry, students. Sorry, I'm used to working in classrooms uh, with with kids, children in in library settings. Uh, called Moon Mythbusters. Okay. So there's a lot of urban myths or and misconceptions that exist about the moon. We just saw some of those. Um, and this looks at some of the more common myths um, and gives them a chance to, quote, bust them. Uh, there are web resources also within the activity write-up. And there is another activity that we're not going to talk about today, but is a really good one for trying to show why the moon um, has to spin. If the moon didn't spin, we would see different sides of the moon, and that's called Penny Moon. That activity explores that idea. It's, it's a really nice activity. Again, there's a comic book, so it not only has stories about these scientists, but there's a comic page for each activity um, that the students can draw or write on about what they learn. So in the Moon Mythbusters, what you do is uh, you'll have a picture of the near side and a picture of the far side of the moon. Um, the picture, and when you, when you assemble these, when you put all of the true statements, all of the non-myths together and they form a puzzle, you'll see a completed picture of the near side. And, when you, and if you correctly put all the false or all the myths in together like a puzzle, you'll see a completed picture of the far side of the moon. And that's what we see here. So if you do this correctly and you put all the correct statements together, you have what we call a true blue blue moon. So all those statements on the left, those are all true, and it creates a uh, picture of the near side. And if you put all the incorrect or the myth statements together, you'll get a complete uh, you'll get a complete picture of the far side of the moon, or the far out far side. Which brings up another point: there is no dark side of the moon. Okay, there there is always a dark side of the moon, but which side of the moon is dark just depends on where it is in its orbit around the Earth. But there is always a near side and a far side. So it's more saying the, the dark side of the moon is not correct. <laughs> Sorry, Pink Floyd, it's a rocking album, but it just doesn't work. All right, getting to know our neighbor. It's just a way to get a little bit more, know more about the moon in general in terms of its size and its um, why it's so bright. And so size, distance, brightness, all that good kind of stuff. So Earth's bright neighbor. So from our position here on the Earth, the moon is the biggest and brightest object in the night sky. That is when it's actually up at night, which is about half the time. Um, but we don't really have a, a sense of how far away it is and how much space is between the Earth and the moon. Right? And how big or how small is the moon compared to the Earth and the sun. So we can use scale models to help us try to better understand these sizes and these distances. All right, so let's take another poll. Let's go one more here. Okay. So if the sun was a giant pumpkin, and I couldn't find a giant pumpkin, so I found a picture of a big pumpkin trash bag filled with leaves. If it was a giant pumpkin like that, how big let me bring up the poll. If the sun were a giant pumpkin, which of those would represent the Earth? So two scale, if the sun was this giant pumpkin, what, how big would the Earth be? Hey, nobody's saying the grapefruit. That's good. A lot of people are saying a peppercorn. Then we've got a, then a grape and beans and kiwi. Okay. Well, let's see here. So if the sun was a big pumpkin or a big pumpkin-looking trash bag full of yard debris, it would be a grape. So these, the Earth is about one one hundredth the diameter of the sun. So you get, one thing also, you got to be careful when you say size, because if you say the sun is a hundred times the size of the Earth, well, do you mean the diameter? Do you mean the volume? You just you got to be careful. But specifically, what we're talking about here is the diameter. So this so 
how big is the Earth you know, across the equator compared to the Sun across its equator. And you could line up about 100 Earths across the equator of the Sun. That's pretty big. All right, now let's look at another poll. So if the Earth is a grape, how big do you think the moon would be? Ah, come on. If the Earth is a grape, which of those items over there to the right represents the moon? Would it be a peppercorn, a bean, or a pony bead? Well, kind of about the same size, so this is a little bit more tricky. But if the Earth was a grape, how big would the moon be? Okay. So the majority of us are saying it's a peppercorn. And that's right. So if the sun was this big giant pumpkin or a big giant pumpkin looking trash bag, the earth would be a grape and the moon would be a peppercorn. Now here, I've actually adjusted these so that so at least in terms of the size, these two were to scale. So the earth's diameter is about four times that of the moon's. So this peppercorn, you could line up four of them across that grape. But this is not the this this distance scale. This is not how far away that they would be in terms of their distance. So we ask you this: If the Earth is a grape and the Moon is a peppercorn, how far apart should they be? Quarter of an inch, one inch, fifteen inches, or thirty-six inches, which is three feet apart, one yard. How far away should they be? It's like we're all sticking within the one inch versus 15 inches. Okay. So if the Earth were a grape and the Moon was a peppercorn, they would be 15 inches apart. I mean, that's, that's not a real long ways away, but when you remember, think of how big a grape and a peppercorn are, it's, it's, it's a good distance. It's a little, little more than a foot. Now, of course, you can do this scale, any scale, and, but when you, whenever you want to include the sun, you got to remember the bigger you make that sun, that's the bigger everything else is going to have to be, and it's the bigger your distances are going to be. And the distances get very big very quickly. So best to maybe stick with this particular model with a big pumpkin, a grape, and a, and a peppercorn. So here's our comic book page. Here they can draw the moon, earth, and the sun, um, making sure that they're the correct size to each other, but that's very difficult to do. Um, at least on this piece of paper, you could do the Earth and the Moon. You can, probably couldn't do their distance unless you made them really small. Um, but I think they get the idea. Okay, so then going on to an activity we call Mirror Moon, and this does bring up another question. I'd like to get everybody's thoughts on. So true or false, the Moon makes its own light. So when we look at the moon, a big full moon, big bright full moon, is that light being produced by the moon itself? And that's what we mean when we say the moon makes its own light. Is it producing its own light? It looks like we have complete agreement on this, and that's correct. That is, that statement is false. The moon does not create its own or make its own light. It is reflecting light from the sun. Within our solar system, the sun is the only thing that generates its own light, for the most part. Uh, visible light that we can see. Everything else reflects it, which is why we see them, because they're taking that sun. Light the sun produces, it bounces off, and it makes it here to Earth, makes it into our eyes, and we can see them. 
so again, the moon is the biggest and brightest object in our in our nighttime sky. That is during the day, of course, it'd be the sun. Uh, the moon shines by reflecting the sun's light, like we like we we said. It does not make its own light. But the moon actually only reflects less than 10% of the sunlight that reaches it. So it's a very dull gray. Um, but even that 10% is enough to make it really, really bright on a full moon. So we can use another model just to kind of help explore this idea. What you'll need is a flashlight, a tennis ball, or maybe like one of those foam craft balls you can get like at, at Michael's. Um, about the size of a, of a tennis ball, just something about that size that's round, and a sheet of aluminum foil, just, you know, really something just big enough to be able to cover that tennis ball or whatever spherical object that you have to model what, what the moon is. Uh, and then you need, like, a dark room or a, a darkened room. And you can probably guess what you do. You simply just shine the flashlight. You put the aluminum foil around the ball, shine the flashlight on it, and in a darkened room, you can really see how that um, that part of the moon, the light shining on it, reflects quite a bit, and the other side um, has nothing to reflect at all, uh, unless there's some kind of ambient light coming in through a window or a door or something. But you'll certainly see how one side is certainly brighter um, than the other. So the aluminum foil by itself, just sitting there in the room, doesn't reflect anything, again, unless you have light coming in through a window or something. Um, but when you put that flashlight on it, it really, bounce, it really reflects on that one side. Okay. So one of the questions that sometimes people ask is, what if there were no moon? I mean, what would be the consequences of that on Earth? Um, and there, there would be some consequences, and we'll explore those in a, in a second. Uh, before, if we want to look at a couple of activities that really do get out, how does the moon really influence um, uh, really influence the Earth, and not just the, you know, what we think it does. Uh, both of these are what we call kinesthetic activities, or mo active models of how the Earth and of the Earth's and Moon's motion, mo Earth's and the Moon's motions in space. Um, these are better suited for kids who are ten and up. Younger than that, um, some of them might be able to understand this, but when you're dealing with these kind of three-dimensional kinesthetic models, younger kids quite aren't ready for that developmentally. That doesn't mean none of them can. Some of them might be able to. And again, that's, that's up to you and, and knowing your audience if it's something that they can do. But we'll show you some things you can do with the younger ones uh, when we get to we'll go through these. Okay, the first one is called the Dance of the Moon and Oceans. And this gets at the idea of tides. Uh, like we had in our question earlier, we asked that the moon, yes, the moon does create tides. And that's what this first activity is trying to model. Um, how, what is happening to the earth and the oceans that creates tides. Uh, this is just a real great example. The Bay of Fundy, this is in Canada. Where you, on the picture on the right, shows you low tide in this bay, or sorry, high tide in this bay. And the picture on the right is low tide. So this is a really extreme example of uh, what can happen during a high and low tide. So tides, simply, are caused by the gravitational of the moon pulling on the oceans and the Earth as it orbits the Earth. So that's what this activity is going to try to model. So you would need, what is that, one, two, three, four, five, six people. Uh, you would have one person would be the moon or the sun, as you can see there in the lower right. And on the left, um, you would have one person in the middle that would represent the Earth, the solid Earth, and then four people around them, and they would represent an ocean or a body of water. And this is a very simple, very simple model of what's happening uh, that, that create that causes this phenomenon that we call tides. And nothing about this is, of course, is to scale. Uh, this picture of the guy playing the moon and the sun is. Uh, Bigger than the people playing the Earth and the oceans, but not that much bigger. All right, so here we see the moon here on the right-hand side in a gray shirt. Here we have the Earth. She's wearing a brown shirt, I believe. You could have more in a green shirt, too. And then around here are four pe people playing the roles of the oceans. Okay. So let me, I'm sorry, let me go back one thing. So the thing about tides is that they're created because, like we said, 
the moon's gravity pulls on the Earth, but also pulls on the oceans. Now, a very uh, basic thing, basic physics, is that in terms of planets and gravitational pull, the closer something is to a planet, or in this case, the closer it is to the moon, the more the, the more effect it feels by the pull of the moon. So in this particular example, this person right here is facing the, the moon, who is standing over here, as we can see in this picture. Let me explain how they got to this position in this picture, though. So this person here in the front, this ocean, if you will, is going to be more influenced by the moon's gravity because they're closer. So what they will do is take three steps forward. Now behind them, the solid Earth and these two oceans who are on either side, they will be less influenced by the pull of the moon simply because they're farther away. So they will then take two steps forward. And this ocean in the back will also be pulled on by the moon, but less so. And so they'll take one step forward. Now, the, the Earth also, like I said, also moves with them. So in a sense, as the Earth steps forward, it sort of leaves the ocean back here. It kind of leaves it behind. And then you ultimately get a shape that looks like this, kind of like an oval. Okay, but you can see the, the ocean that was closest to the moon has moved up quite a bit more. They've moved up two steps. You clearly can't tell. And this ocean is left, kind of left behind. So you see the shape that is formed, kind of a, uh, a bit of an oval due to the gravitational pull of the moon. So if you were to move the moon over this way and start over here, then this person would make three steps. This, these line people would take two steps. This ocean would take one step. And this just all changes as the moon would orbit. Everybody would take different amount of steps. And you would get this same shape. So there you see our picture how it corresponds with our diagram. Tides are uh, um, they're kind of difficult to understand. Um, and so this is a very, very simple uh, model trying to show that everything gets pulled towards the moon, but some of it gets pulled more because it's closer to the moon um, than other parts. So the parts that are the oceans that are pulled the most, those are experiencing a high tide. Even on the opposite side, it's a high tide because they're farthest from the, from the Earth. And here, the oceans that are closest are experiencing a low tide. And then as the Earth spins, the tides will flow in and out and just in the pattern. Okay. And if there were no moon, if there were no moon, would we still see this phenomenon? Uh, we would, but not as much. Um, the sun does have a lot of gravity, of course, much bigger than, this, than the, the moon, but it's also much farther away. So while the sun's gravity would uh, pull, does contribute to our tide, it's only about a third of the amount. So you could do this same exercise with somebody being the sun, but everybody would just take smaller, would take less, would fewer, or smaller steps. And you would still see tides, but just not, not the same magnitude. That's with no moon. So if the, if the Earth were without the moon, we would still have tides, but they would be smaller. So here is in the comic book where uh, kids can uh, draw the effect that the smaller tides might have on sea life, boating, or a visit to the beach. Uh, another activity called lunar phases, a, a dance under the sun. Uh, this is a, another, again another kinesthetic model that helps students under kids understand why we have phases. I mean, there's a very common misconception, um, even among we've, we, they've they've interviewed you know college graduates you know at Harvard about this. You know why why do we have phases? And, and they talk about well because the Moon is passing through the Earth's shadow, and that creates phases, and that's not right. That helps create uh, a blank. Sorry, a blank on me. Um, eclipses. 
um, but not, not phases. So this involves going outside, uh, particularly if it's a day where the moon is up during the day and you can go see it. Just take out a, a, um, a little uh, styrofoam ball like we see there and it's just poked on the end of a pin. And what you want to do is hold it up and hold it until you see that it matches what the moon looks like. So in this, in this example, you can see that the styrofoam ball has a dark, is not lit up on this side and it's brighter on this side. And that matches what, what we see in the moon on that same day. So this really helps them get to understand that use the actual moon to compare to your moon and use the actual sun that's in the sky. And in this case, the individual holding that moon is the Earth. So you're looking at it from the Earth's perspective and you're watching the shadow move across the moon depending on where the sun is and depending on where, where the moon is um, from the Earth's perspective. It's really powerful. Um, and really, it can be really effective in helping to understand that moon's phases are simply caused by where is the moon in relationship to the Earth and the Sun. It's, it's the angles. It doesn't have anything to do with it being in the shadow of the Earth. So there we see this more examples. Uh, this on the uh, left here would be a new moon where the moon is between the Earth and the Sun. Then we would see, well, then a first quarter moon down here. A full moon where the Earth is between the moon and the sun, and then finally a third quarter moon. Now, if you have younger kids, it's sometimes it's just uh, kind of best for them just to know that there are phases, and what do we call those phases, and what do they look like? And this is a really fun activity using Oreo cookies. Uh, you can do this using six cookies. Um, the idea is to simply, you know, twist open a cookie and make sure that all the frosting stays on one side. And then you just scrape off the frosting to match what the moon looks like, to match these faces we all see lined up over here. So for a, for a full moon, you wouldn't have to do anything but twist the cookie. So all, all of the cream on the inside would represent the light from a full moon. A new moon would be the other half that has no cream, no frosting on it. That would be a new moon, a completely dark moon. So then they just twist open cookies and scrape off the frosting to get the different shapes. It's, it's really fun to do. Adults really like doing it. Uh, and there's also uh, links, a uh, YouTube link here, other links in the module uh, to see uh, st about other stories, poems, and songs that, that, that the moon has influenced that could also be talked about while they're, while they're making their loony, lunar phases. Then when we're done, they can create their own, their own poem. We've got lines for them to fill in, and we suggest how they can fill those lines in. And then there are some, um, some examples, some words that they could use to create their poem. Again, looking at the cultural aspects, how the moon has affected culture or, or influenced culture, not necessarily how it has influenced physically the Earth. Uh, so some other points about um, if there was no moon, we wouldn't obviously have a nearby moon to study through telescopes. Any telescopes would uh, simply be looking at stars and other objects, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, like we mentioned earlier, if there's a full moon, it can provide an awful lot of light, particularly if you're in a very dark area. In fact, if you're in a very dark area and you want to use a telescope, I recommend not doing it on a full moon night. Um, particularly, don't look at a full moon through a telescope. It, it can <laughs> It can, it can hurt. It can sting your eye a little bit. And it's just, and in a full moon, you really can't see a whole lot on the surface anyway, because there's, there's really no shadow to help you see things. Um, probably wouldn't have a whole lot of stories or legend about the moon, particularly werewolves. That, and that's pretty important to, to the werewolf story. And we certainly wouldn't have all the music and all the poetry in which the moon is referenced. And you, you might even run into some people who might argue that without the moon, space exploration might not exist or might be not at the point it's at. Because those are our first target in sending not only, not only people but also spacecraft out into space was the moon. It was, that was the first target. So you might be able to argue that uh, space exploration not, might not be where it is today or we might not even have it at all. Okay, so that, is, that wraps up um, the activities we wanted to share with you all today.
Um, again, all dealing with the cultural connections to the moon and, and a little bit the physical connections, how the moon does influence us. Um, and we have a question, can you do it in the cold or the hot? Is that referring to the, um, uh, sorry, it's losing me. Are you referring to like the, the lunar phases activity where you're outside and you have the uh, styrofoam ball on the pin? Oh, either way. As long as you have, as long as the sun's out, <laughs> you can actually get the sunlight. It doesn't work too good on a cloudy day. But as long as you got the sun out, um, and you can see the moon, in a, in a, it's in a phase that it's up during the day. That's another thing people don't think you can see the moon during the day, but you actually can. Um, so just double check, make sure the moon's in the sky that day, and that the sun's shining. Doesn't matter if it's cold or not. To us, it doesn't matter. <laughs> now, your kids might not want to be up too hot or too cold, but... Uh, but that, that, that's up to you. And one thing I also say, if you're not too sure about where to look or, or where to check to see if the moon's going to be up on a particular day, contact your local amateur astronomy group. They will be more than happy to help you, uh, let, let you know if it is or not, help you out find that answer, and maybe even come out with telescopes to look at the moon. The moon's kind of fun to look at during the day just because through a telescope, because it's not something you would normally do. Um, you, cer you certainly can, just make sure it's not too close to the sun. So if you go to our, uh, our website there, explore, the explore website slash Marvel Moon, uh, like I pointed out earlier, all the background information and resources. Uh, how many sessions do you think we need to complete the activities? Um, there are recommendations for each, each, each activity has its own write-up with, acti with a materials list and a buying list and all that kind of stuff. It has, it has a recommendation, recommended time in them. So again, you can, you know, do the full activity as it's written up and probably get it done in the time that's, that's recommended or you can shorten it and just do certain parts to make it as long as you need it. It's totally up to you how you, how you want to do this. Um, you know, the the, uh, the dance under the moon that could or under the sun, that could take a while just trying to get everybody to see what they need to be seeing and, and understanding. Uh, the, the lunar tides dance, that could take a while too. Um, it's it's just, it's really gonna get to you, and you you know. Mythbusters, the basic characteristics of our moon, all of these things we talked about today, all the write-ups for them, everything you would possibly that we think you would possibly need to know to successfully do these, implement these in your programs. That information should all be there. Um, other things you can do, like I mentioned, partner with an astronomical society. They're all over the place. Um, if you go to NASA, the JPL Night Sky Network, um, you could find, you could put in your zip code or your town, and it'll tell you where the closest astronomical society is. Um, and in the Marvel Moon activities somewhere, there should be a link to tell, take you to that and let you and let you find the local society. They're always eager to help. Um, they like, they love doing this kind of a thing. So don't don't be shy. Uh, and trying to contact them. Uh, another thing they can do is they can create a zine about what they've learned about the moon and you can add to the collection during your library. Uh, so here's an opportunity that you can take advantage of directly related to the moon where you can use some of the activities we've talked about today. Uh, it's an event called International Observe the Moon Night and this is the fifth year that this will have taken place uh, this year it's on September 6th, 2014. It's a Saturday. Um, I'll be honest and say the moon isn't exactly in a really great phase to observe. It's almost a full moon, but not quite. But given we try to avoid holidays, and of course we want them on weekends, and we try to get it to where it's not too hot in some locations, uh, and making sure school's in session, it would, it, all these things have to come together in just the right way it didn't really work out for us so great this year but september 6th is the day um you know call your get a hold of your local amateur astronomy club have them bring telescopes out to your library do some of the activities we've talked about um and really this event is all about just people going out and looking at the moon you don't even have to have telescopes to be honest you can just go out and look at it and see it and do the activities um you know anybody can participate in any way they want to Go to observethemoonnight.org to find out more information about it. Um, 
and there's some more activities on there. There's even a map. So if you know you're going to have an activity, you can quote unquote register with the website and put in your address and the Google engine we have on there will know where you're at and it'll put a pin on our map and you can see your activity is set up on the map with all the other um, events that are happening around the world. Last year I think we had 50 or 60 some events. No, I'm sorry. We had 500 over 500 events in over 50 countries across the world, around the world. So it's really, really cool stuff. Uh, asking what time? Well, that totally depends on you. Um, you know, what time you want to have it, when you can have it. Um, of course, you want to make sure the moon is up. And again, your your local astronomy club can help you with that. Um, it'll be, I'll say, near a full moon. So it'll rise shortly before the sun goes down. So plenty of time over the evening uh, to be able to look at the moon that night. Uh, another resource to look at if you want some more information, um, not just about the moon, but other uh, activity uh, regarding other uh, planets, you can go to what was called the Year of the Solar System. This is a NASA um, program that ran for a couple of years, and it's still kind of ongoing. But if you go here, you can look at different activities by topic and by, uh, you know, um, like informal ed or formal ed type, type of venue. Lots more you can find there. In addition to that, there's something that really just came out the past few months called nasawavelength.org. Here you can find more resources, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics resources. Not just about planetary science, but also more astronomy related or related to the sun or related to earth science. Um, very simple search engine there. Again, you can look up by, by topic. Uh, you can look up by audiences. You know, Again, informal audiences, formal education all that kind of stuff. NASAWavelength.org and all these URLs, NASA Wavelength, the YSS URL, and the Observe the Moon Night URL will be in the follow-up email that you will get from ALA, I believe, tomorrow. Hey, does anybody have any uh, lingering questions that's eating at them they want to ask? Thank you, thank you. We, we, we enjoy doing these kinds of things um, and, and talking to everybody about these resources, letting them know they're out there. Of course, they're free. Again, use them as you want to. You know your audiences. Um, we just kind of give you a baseline for what, what you can do and let you ultimately decide what you want to do. Uh, Louie-Ann, will this be available online? Uh, if you mean the recording, yes. ALA will send out a, a link to the recording. Um, and then actually, we will also put it up on our on the Marvel Moon website under the resources. We'll add a, a URL there also. So the recording will be. And all these activities that we showed you, yes, they are online also on that Marvel Moon website under activities. All the write-ups are there online. Uh, Don has a question. Uh, why does the moon, when full, appear so perfectly round? Because uh, it is. <laughs> uh, the, the, the simple question, again, is gravity. That, that, that gravity comes back up again. Uh, most objects, not well, not most, objects in the solar system that are big enough, that have enough gravitational pull, nature naturally, <laughs> nature naturally wants to put things in a sphere, in a circle or a sphere. Um, and so as long as an object is large enough, it will put itself into a sphere uh, like that. Now, of course, once you actually get up to the moon, it doesn't look like a perfect circle. There's mountains and crater rims and all these kind of things. But yes, looking at it as we see it from here, like a full moon, yeah, it looks perfectly round because that's, that's the way nature tries to make things. It's kind of the way it is. Oh. Uh, if you don't have a telescope, that, you know, that's okay. Um, you know, the moon is great to look at. That, that's a great offer. You know, you don't need a telescope to do the, um, you know, what do you see in the moon activity. That's all about just looking at the moon and seeing the shapes. Um, so you, you don't necessarily need a telescope. Um, you can just, uh, just look at it. You may know somebody who has some binoculars. Binoculars are really great, too, for looking at the moon. You don't need a telescope if you want to get a close-up view. Uh, binoculars are, are, are great. So you can simply have an event in which you talk about the moon, and you can kids can learn about the moon, um, 
and just go out and, and look at it and tell stories about it, like looking at clouds. Uh, Colleen, do we have other materials that we send out, such as the comic book or things like stickers? Uh, for the most part, really, all we have is what's online. Uh, we um, we do have one thing. A couple of years ago, we had uh, made available what we called INOM, which is short for International Observe the Moon Night INOM kits that contained um, binoculars, a tripod, uh, a notebook with all the Marvel Moon activities in it, um, and a few, other, a few other things in them. We have one of those here. But I don't believe we. No, I don't remember if we did or not. But we sent it about. Basically, no. We what, basically what there is is what's online. Um, there are stickers for INOM that you can order. Um, there's a link to that on the INOM website. But we actually need to update that because the logo has been updated recently. So yeah, sorry. There's there's really not much, um, at least particularly to this module, other than the comic book. Just a few more minutes, about ready to wrap up. Anybody have any other questions? Well, maybe. <laughs> so I was just about to say no. I want to thank you all for hanging out, hanging on with us um, for the, during this hour, and for joining us. And hope you guys make good use of of the materials. Um, if you ever have a question, uh, you can send an email to explore at lpi.usra.edu, and we'll be happy to help you out any way we can. All right. Well, again, thank you everyone for joining us. And uh, hope to be here from you soon, or just hope you have a good time and are able to use these materials.